Welcome back to Symmetries and Quantum Mechanics. Last time we looked at representations, linear representations of groups, and I drew a correspondence between representations of groups and quantum mechanical systems that are symmetric under those groups, or the symmetries labeled by those groups. And also we started looking at the notion of a sub-representation. And I ended the last lecture with a theorem, quoting a theorem, and this is the theorem that we're gonna to prove today. We've already proved the theorem um, by uh, kind of exercise, but today I'll just go through the, the, the steps in detail. They're hardly more complicated than what I mentioned last time, but we'll do the details. So the theorem, what does it say? It says, suppose you have a linear representation of your group on some vector space V. So V is a vector space. Eventually we think always of vector spaces as the Hilbert spaces of quantum mechanical systems. And we let W be some subspace of V. And let's suppose that it's stable under G. So remember that when a subspace is stable under G, it means every symmetry operation never takes you outside of W. Then the theorem says there exists a complement, W naught, that's another subspace of V, um, which is also stable under G. Hopefully it's kind of like, you know, like how, how could that even be not correct, right? It, it, hopefully this is, it, it should feel kind of obvious from the picture I drew last time. So I drew this picture of three-dimensional space and I said, imagine that your group is sort of keeping this two-dimensional space stable. Then there exists a complement, which is also stable under rotations as well, right? And that picture is the picture that we're gonna use. Um, and the proof is, the way we're gonna prove this is we remember, you should remember or look up you should go back to your linear algebra resources and remember that there's a correspondence between projections. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between projections of a vector space and subspaces. And there's a corresponding con connection between kernels of projections and complements. So there's a correspondence between projections and the space subspaces that they project onto. And you get for free a second subspace called the complement, or W, we call it W naught, of course. Um, and those complements are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the kernels of the projection, the things the projection projects to zero. So the strategy of the proof is, uh, is relatively uh, simple. What do we want to do? We want to construct a projection corresponding to W the right projection, the one that's symmetric, and then argue that the kernel is also symmetric, and then we're kind of done. And the, the main device, like as soon as you see the trick, then the rest of the proof is just checking things. And I mentioned this, this, this trick last time, it's called the averaging trick, right? So what do we do is we just suppose we have, suppose we have some projection and it's not symmetric or stable under G. So suppose P goes from V to W is a is just a, any old projection. All right, so it chops off everything except for W, but it might not be symmetric. And I haven't even said what symmetric means for a projection yet, but I'll get to that in a second. And then we, we build a, a new operator called P naught and P naught is going to turn out to be a projection and we're going to argue that first P maps onto W, secondly that P is a projection and thirdly that P is symmetric and then we will use that to infer that W naught, the corresponding W naught, the complement that it gives is also invariant. So here's a couple of comments, right? First, note, 
that P naught maps V into W. Maybe this is not super obvious, but I, I hope to make this obvious by the end of this line. Um, so what do we know? So we know that P maps from V to W, right? That's a correct statement. That's a, a statement by assumption. We just assumed we have some projection, some projection. Um, we know that v, W is stable under the action of G. So that means the corresponding map rho of t, what does it mean? It means that if I, I'm inside of w, then stable means I stay inside of w. So that's a true statement. But t inverse is in g. And so that also implies that rho t uh, inverse, which is the same as rho t inverse, that's what it means, homomorphism, keeps w and w. And, sorry, I, I was a bit, I was confused about. First, we're going to prove that P naught keeps W to W, not V to W. So these are three, three statements, right? We know that, we know that, and we know that. And now let's look at this, this, this map here. So rho T inverse, if you're inside W, you stay in W when you apply P naught, right? So let X be in W. Let's look at P naught on X. It's the same as one over G sum T in G O T P. Okay. So rho T inverse keeps X inside of W. That's that statement there. So that means that thing's inside W. P keeps W inside W. And rho T keeps anything inside W in W. So we've just learned that P naught maps anything in W to anything to something in W. Further, it's even better than that. If we give this thing a name, x prime, p is a projection, right? So the whole point of a projection is that when you apply p to anything in w, you get it back again. Yep. That's right, yeah, taking the inverse of the representation is automatically the representation of the inverse. That comes from this homomorphism property. So remember, rho, to be called a, a representation. So we know that rho t rho s is the same as rho t s. So if S is T inverse, then that's the same as the identity. Yep. And that implies that this thing is also the same as rho T inverse. All right. So we know that the projection preserves anything inside W. So we get something kind of interesting happening here, right? So we end up with in the next line, one over G, rho t multiplied by rho t inverse of x. But that's just the same as summing up x g times, which is the same as x. So not only does p naught map w to w, p naught is also a projection on w because we can do it twice, right? And we'll get the same thing. And 
sense of we can kind of go further now now I'm going to explain how a projection can be symmetric under a group right I've explained what it means for a, a subspace to be stable under a group but I've not told you what it means for a projection to be symmetric under the group I'm going to give you that definition now so another thing we learn is that if we do the projection p naught and then we do any other We, we do a symmetry operation labeled by S, so we first project, then do symmetry, and that's actually the same as doing the symmetry, then projecting. And uh, the way I'm sort of not going to prove this is if we just look back at this expression here. So if I now Imagine doing a row S in here. I'm going to try and get away with just annotating this, this previously written equation. Then I've got a row S in here. But then I can combine row S with the row T inverse in here using this property up here. Um, so then that becomes row T inverse s but then we can change variables in the summation here so this becomes t prime we sum over all t prime of the form um, s t so if you sum over all elements in the group um, you can change variable and sum over all elements of the group by just multiplying on the left here, that's a, that's a change of variable. And it's an invertible change of variable because this is a group, so everything has an inverse. And then that changes this summation here to t prime and t prime. And then there's a uh, s inverse here. And then you can use that property again to pull that s inverse out here. Uh, something's gone wrong. Oh, no, no, nothing's gone wrong, I guess. No? Yes. Uh, was it the T inverse? Ah, yeah. Here, you, 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 you mean when I change the variable here, I should have changed it differently. Thanks, yeah. Like so, right? I think that's the one I wanted. I wanted the inverse on the S. Um, and then that gives an inverse here, and then we get a row S coming out. Yeah. Okay, so that's... I'll leave the, the, the checking of this yellow annotation as an exercise, but you can see that the trick involved here is putting it in here, doing a change of variables, and then pulling it out to the left. So that's how we end up with this expression here and then now effectively we can define our complement so we let x be, be something so this is a projection so there is a correspond I didn't write that the kernel of this projection to define our complement and the only thing we have to check is that this particular complement is stable under the group that's the whole part of this the theorem the whole content of this theorem that the complement itself is also invariant or symmetric under the group so let's let x be something in there we're gonna uh, we're going to apply, and so what does that mean? That means that P naught X equals zero. Uh, but this also, uh, 
implies that rho s compose p naught compose rho s inverse of x is zero. So this expression follows from this expression. So if I take p naught, it's equal to doing a symmetry, p naught, and then the symmetry inverted. So that's what I've done here. Although I wanted to put the inverse here. Sorry, I'll put the inverse there, if you forgive me. Um, and then what do we learn? We learn that P naught rho S of X is equal to rho S of P naught of X, which is zero. And that implies that this thing, whatever it is, also lives in W naught. So W naught is stable under G. So we have really two tricks going on in this theorem. The proof of this theorem, one is the averaging trick. You take a non -in potentially non-invariant projection and you create an invariant projection by averaging over undoing the symmetry and then redoing the symmetry. And then the other part of the theorem, if you like, is just a standard change of variables argument like this. So once you're comfortable with these two things, uh, we will be able to apply this result to learn quite some interesting uh, results about representations. And in fact, we'll discover things called irreducible representations as a direct consequence. Okay, there's kind of a, a remark, corollary uh, proposition. I'm gonna give a totally different proof now of the same statement, but using quantum mechanics and unitary representations. So this is the context we truly care about in quantum mechanics. We don't particularly care about linear vector spaces. They're not so relevant, but unitary uh, Hilbert spaces and unitary representations, that's the bread and butter of quantum mechanics. Um, and we're gonna use, we're gonna assume now that we not only have a linear representation, but a unitary representation. Uh, and we know, uh, you know, such a unitary representation is a symmetry, right? So it preserves inner products. So each symmetry, thanks to Wigner's theorem of quantum mechanics, each symmetry transformation is a unitary. Uh, we're representing each of these symmetries by, uh, labeled by the group, by unitaries. What is the defining property of a unitary? A unitary preserves the scalar product between two vectors for all x and y in the Hilbert space. Okay, so that's what it means to be unitary. So uh,
So we'll do is look at the matrix representation of OS, right? We can either think abstractly about these unitaries or we can just choose the basis and look at the representation. And, and we're gonna let W be stable. Now it's subspace of a Hilbert space. And we're going to choose a basis for our Hilbert space, uh, which uh, extends the basis for W. Since we're working in finite dimensions for this course, part of the course, we imagine we have a basis for W, this stable subspace. You can just choose a random orthogonal basis. And then we make a basis for the full Hilbert space just by adding vectors until we get the full Hilbert space basis. And how do we make sure that that space is, is orthonormal? Well, we use the Gram-Schmidt process to, to ensure that all the additional basis vectors are so we have something like this, right? You have a basis for, for W. And then you have the basis for the rest of the Hilbert space. And we're going to write our matrix for row RS for this, rep, uh, for this representation here with respect to this particular basis. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means as a matrix, it looks like this, right? So I'm gonna How does a unitary matrix act that preserves a subspace? Well, it's not allowed to map, suppose you have some you know, here's a vector in our Hilbert space here. And it's written with respect to this basis. So these are the parts of the vector that belong to W. And these are the bits of the vector that belong to something else, not W. You know? w, or w perpendicular. I can even say that because we have a scalar product. See, the, the, what, I, uh, what I should have prefaced this all with is the statement that in this proof up here, we didn't have a scalar product. Nowhere in this, this theorem did we have access to a scalar product, so it was very hard for us to talk about complementary subspaces. The minute you have a scalar product and you can measure angles between things, then there's a kind of canonical, there is a canonical uh, complement to every subspace, right? It's just the perpendicular subspace. And so I can just write it down. These are all the vectors that are perpendicular to the vectors in W, and perpendicularity is measured by the scalar product. So let's think of how this unitary acts, right? By assumption, W is stable under this matrix, which means that if you're in here, this matrix better not map you out of here. So there's stuff in there, right? There's stuff in this part of the matrix. But there for sure is nothing here. This is zero. Has to be. Now there's this nice little result about unitary matrices, the norms of all the rows and all the columns is one. So the norm of every column here is one, the norm of every row here is one. So this tells us that there not only, not only is this zero, but there has to be a whole lot of stuff in here and the norm is one of the rows. And now the minute you have that, we are almost done. And the only thing we have to argue is that RS doesn't map anything from W perpendicular back into W. And 
if we look at the adjoint of that matrix that gives us the answer to that. So the adjoint also has to have this structure because R, the adjoint of R is the same as R inverse. And so that implies that this other part up here is zero as well. Uh, can I repeat the argument that there's no zero parts here? No, no. Uh, on the right? This one? Oh, oh, down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, so if, the, if you have a unitary matrix, and I'll draw one here, if you look at this, any row of a unitary matrix, then the norm of the elements in that matrix row have to be one. Okay. So if, if I look at a row like down here, and I look at the norm, well, the norm of the, this vector is zero, but it has to be one, so there has to be something in here. And so to finish off the proof, um, RS dagger, which is the same as RS inverse, which is the same as RS inverse, also has the same structure. So that's how we get the second zero up there. And now it's clear that W naught is W perpendicular, right? So I've actually given you two proofs now of, of the same result, but in different contexts. And it turns out this is going to be an extremely useful uh, result that will lead us to discovering things called irreducible representations. So in maths and physics, there are things, when you define a class of things, there's usually atoms of those things. So uh, in physics, the atoms of physics are atoms. Everything's made of atoms in, in physics. In mathematics, when you define a bunch of things, then uh, like, for example, groups or uh, vector spaces, or you, know, you have a whole bunch of, a class of mathematical objects, then you usually have in mind that you want to do some operations on these things. So you can put these things together to make other mathematical things. In the case of vector spaces, you can take vector spaces and you can take their direct sums and you can take their tensor products. And that's how you build other vector spaces from your original vector spaces. So when you look at the category of all vector spaces, you see that it's not only just all vector spaces, but there's these extra operations you're allowed to do. And then you ask yourself, what, are the, what can I build from these operations of direct sum and tensor product? Well, you can build all vector spaces because you can just take elementary vector spaces, say one-dimensional vector spaces, and start direct summing them with other one-dimensional vector spaces, and you automatically get two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional vector spaces, and so on. So kind of the atoms of finite dimensional vector spaces are one-dimensional vector spaces. And so that's, that's kind of neat. No? You, you can build everything from small little atoms. Then you look at something like groups. So then you ask yourself, you know, I have a finite group, and I can take the direct product of the group, I can take a union of this group with another group, I can take the, the uh, semi-direct product with another group. There's quite a few operations you can use to build new groups from old groups. And then you ask yourself the question, okay, uh, which, which, which groups can I not build from other groups? What are the atoms of groups? And they turn out to be things called simple groups. Those turn out to be much more complicated uh, objects than vector spaces. And they have been classified, but it took decades and decades and decades of work to finally understand what are the atoms of groups. 
Um, we can keep playing this game all day. Every time you invent a class of mathematical objects, you ask what are the operations I can use to build new ones, and uh, what are the things I cannot build from anything else. So in physics, of course, the atoms of physics are atoms, but they, and you can't build one atom from the other, except that you can, because you now know that atoms are made from protons and neutrons, and neutrons and protons are made from quarks, and quark, and, and so you, really, the atoms of physics are more quarks, but that, that's a, another story. Um, so in group representation theory, it's the same story yet again. We're going to ask ourselves the question, which representations cannot be built from other representations by direct sums and another operation which we're going to introduce soon, namely the tensor product operation. They have a name. And these things, the atoms of rep theory they have a name and they're called irreducible representations. and I better tell you what they are. So let's pause a moment to sort of appreciate this thing. So a representation is irreducible if firstly it's not the trivial representation. That doesn't get to be called irreducible. Um, and the only subspaces of V stable under the group in the sense that we've just ex explored is zero and the whole, whole vector space itself. It doesn't, in other words, the action of the group never breaks up into a to a block matrix like that. There's no way you can write a basis, no matter how you look through all the bases of V, you can choose whatever basis you want, you can search forever and ever and ever, you'll never be able to look, make all the matrices RS look like that. There'll always be one matrix that's got matrix elements somehow in here and here. That's the same thing. Yep, question? Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. I didn't specify the row here. Uh, I should have, but this is one of these things that people do uh, where you'll have, unfortunately have to get used to this, this abbreviated way of talking. Yeah, I better, I better explain what I left out, right? There's, there's an ellipsis here, right? Um, dot, dot, dot. What, what do, when you hear these words, you automatically got to learn to start filling in the ellipsis uh, because they are, there is an ellipsis here. And what is the ellipsis in this case? Well, when I say a rep V is irreducible, then what I've actually said is I've in said thus, uh, we assume there is a homomorphism row that goes from G to G L V. Um, you know, this, just this, this, this word rep V implies 
that we've assumed there's a homomorphism that goes from G uh, to G LV. It's implied but not said. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so when I say a rep is irreducible, uh, the question was: Were there several homomorphisms? Yeah. So we, the, the when we say a representation, we've selected one homomorphism. Yeah. I hope that helps. So, but just the just this text here: a rep v of G. Um, You know, people leave away the, see, I even left the G away, right? Um, the group's usually implicit. When I say A rep V, it means that I've assumed the existence of a specific homomorphism from G to the GLVs. So that's the, it's efficiency in communication. There's, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll get used to it. So irreducible representations are somehow special, right? You can't pull them into smaller representations. So now, of course, the first thing you should do whenever you see a definition in maths and physics is ask, is this definition vacuous? Is it, can it be that the set of irreducible representations that GD empty set? Like I've just defined a thing, but nothing exists. Well, there's an example. Um, which you kind of get them automatically from this definition. So all one-dimensional representations are ir irreducible, right? They're not equal to the zero. You cannot have a sub-representation of a one-dimensional representation, like what would it mean to break a one-by-one one one matrix into blocks? So therefore, it's irreducible. So that's, that's pretty cool. So we've learned that at least one-dimensional representations are irreducible. It turns out, and here's the interesting thing, uh, I mean, I guess I'll spoil the result now. Um, uh, so all irreducible representations, irreps, So later, we're going to learn that all irreducible representations of abelian groups are 1D. If your group is abelian, you know, do A then B is the same as B then A, then every single representation that's irreducible of that group is one dimensional. There's nothing else. There's nothing out there. Uh, converse is not true. So non-abelian groups have higher dimensional irreps. So there's the interesting part. The, the fact that operations don't commute is intertwined with the dimensions of the irreducible representations of these groups. And I hope you can sort of already see this is kind of almost in a way, like this statement should be super obvious to you, right? Because an irreducible representation that's 1D, well, obviously everything commutes, right? Because it's a number and numbers commute with each other. And uh, so, you know, at least one direction is super clear, right? If you have a one dimensional representation, then it must have uh, the bit, the non trivial part that it comes from must have been abelian. And if you have something abelian, then it's sort of plausible that you know, those matrices are all commuting with each other so they can all be diagonalized simultaneously so that then you can block diagonalize them into one by one matrices so that, yeah, I've kind of almost with those words hinted you towards the proof of this, this part of the statement. But what about this part? Well, if you, have a bunch of, if you have a bunch of things that don't commute, if I do one thing then the other, it's not the same as the reversed order, then one dimensional representations don't capture that at all because numbers commute with each other. So you're going to need something bigger to capture those, that non-abelianness, non non-commutingness. 
And the things that are bigger are bigger matrices. And matrices don't generally commute. So that's why a non-abelian group will typically have quite large irreducible representations. They won't be one-dimensional. Some will be. Some will be. But those one-dimensional representations will be only of subgroups of your non-abelian group, namely abelian subgroups. Okay, so I've sort of spoiled a big part of, of the course, but, and I've al al almost told you how to prove this part, and the second part should be, you know, there's not much to prove there once you agree with the first part. Uh, so, but what we're going to do now is sort of take a deeper dive, under, uh, explain how irreps arise, how to find them, and how to classify them. Because another thing that I want to keep banging on in this course is a representation is the same as a quantum mechanical system. Like every time you've written down a, a representation, every time you had that matrix and how it acts on that vector space, you've just defined a quantum mechanical system symmetric under the group. And you've come one step closer to this quantization program that I mentioned in the, the previous lecture. So whenever a mathematician says irreducible unitary representation, you should be thinking, quantum mechanical system with those symmetries. Like that's the physicist interpretation. I'll just you know, highlight that mental dictionary that you should have. Okay, that's, you should always have in the back of my, your minds, right? Whenever I say these, the math terminology, irreps, blah, 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 reps, really what you're thinking is somehow a quantum mechanical system that has symmetries, transformations labeled by the group. Because as we go through the course, we'll be saying all the math terminology quite a lot, and the connection to quantum mechanics can get quickly forgotten unless you keep reminding yourself. Okay, and now comes a big one a big one. There's a couple of really big results in representation theory and the beauty of it is all I can tell you these big results within about six lectures and then the rest of representation theory is the hard work of working out all the details and here's a big one and already you kind of guessed it from the previous result. So this, this is the result that this is, these results are solid gold in math and solid gold in physics. Why is this so great? It says that no matter how complicated your representation is, even infinitely dimensional, you don't have to worry about the search space of infinite dimensional things. You can always understand a representation as just a direct sum of irreps. So the minute you understand all the irreps of your group, all these atomic representations, you've gotten all representations. They're all there at your disposal just by direct summing them in different ways. And this result that I spoiled it already tells you that you now under, almost completely understand the representations of abelian groups. So anything where everything commutes is always a direct sum of one-dimensional representations. That's it. You've actually learned a tremendous amount in these two theorems. 
you know, how many copies there are and so on, that's non-trivial, but you can build them all with just direct sums. So the, this is the, the operation of direct sum is how you build bigger systems in maths. And in physics, we also have built bigger systems with the direct sum operation. In advanced quantum theory earlier, you saw that uh, the direct sum operation is like the OR quantifier, and that's the way to imagine building these bigger systems. So it's a fantastic theorem. It tells us that there's nothing else out there than IREPS, at least for finite dimension or finite order groups. Unfortunately, <laughs> things get mega complicated for infinite groups, uh, non-compact groups. You have things called irreducibles and uh, indecomposables and all kinds of representations. And the representation theory of continuous non-compact groups is wild. Uh, but luckily, we don't care about those in physics much. A little bit. Okay, I'm just gonna, it's, I'll prove it, but do I really need to prove it? Yeah, I'm gonna, but do I really need to? Like, think, how hard would this be to prove? What have we just proved before? We said that if you've got a stable subspace, then there's always an auto a complement. What's stopping you just iterating that procedure? Now you look at your W and then you say, can I break W up into another two pieces? Well, nothing stops you. You just keep on doing it. That's the proof. So of course I'm gonna write it out more formally, but just imagine applying this previous result over and over again until that you cannot break it up anymore. Yeah? I think this picture says it best. If you can break all your matrices up into looking like this, then what's stopping you doing it again to this block? And what's stopping you doing it again to the sub blocks and so on? Answer, nothing. You stop when you can't go any further. So that's the proof, and I'm going to write it out more formally. But, I... but that's, in effect, what I'm going to do. So let V be a linear representation of G. Remember, that means I've selected a homomorphism G to GLV. Uh, the arguments and induction on what? We have to in do induction on something, and the, we're going to do an induction on the dimension of, the of this representation. Uh, I think I previously said that zero isn't irreducible. Ooh, was that naughty? I guess it was. Okay, I, I painted myself into a corner here. Um, so by convention, okay, the definition here does not allow zero to be an irrep. Because part of the definition is a rep is irreducible if V is not equal to that, right? So that's, that's a bit of a problem. Um, I'm going to just veto that and just allow that to be a rep as well. Otherwise, I can't do the induction properly. Yep. That's a good question. What's the reason for not including it there? I actually don't know the answer. I have to look that up. Because um, this comes from the book of Sir, and I do have some part of the book here. Wait, I'll look if I just made a transcription error. That could actually be what happened. So otherwise, it's a bit strange. Ah, no, okay, yeah. Oof, 
Okay. <laughs> Tricky mathematicians. Okay. So it, it, the definition is this one. So d just ignore the nonsense I just said for the past two minutes. <laughs> okay. I, um, we're going to do an induction on the dimension of V. So what if V is zero? So you're like, well, that's not an irrep. Well, what is it? It's an empty direct sum of vector spaces. So there's this thing in maths, you can, have the, uh, you can have the union of some things, but you can also have the empty union of things. So what, you know, some, something is a union of nothing or an empty union. That's also allowed. So the vector space zero is the empty direct sum. It's the actual definition of the direct sum allows you to have a direct sum of no things. So the direct sum of no things is V equals naught. So although V equals naught is not an irreducible representation, it is a direct sum of ir irreducible representations, namely the empty direct sum. That's perverse word trickery, but that's how it is, right? So that's how we get around this kind of funny Funny problem here. Okay. Okay. So it is. Where was I? So we've already got the base case of the induction now. So we can now assume that the dimension of our vector space is strictly bigger than zero. And we've got two cases, right? Either the representation is irre irreducible, meaning it's not the direct sum of anything smaller. Well, in that case, we're finished. Or case two, We know that V, as a consequence of this previous result that we labored through, is a direct sum of some W and some W naught, right? And the dimension of W is strictly less than the dimension of V, and so is the dimension of W naught. But by the inductive hypothesis, we've already proven that the, both of these de decompose into irreducible representations. That's the inductive hypothesis, so we're done. So if W breaks into a direct sum of irreps and W naught, oh, I said prime, I said naught, and W naught breaks up into a direct sum of irreducible representations, then the direct sum of these two is per definition a direct sum of irreducible representations. And so that's how we prove the result, yeah? Yeah, so the question is, if we went all the way back down to zero, then we'd have an infinite direct sum of zeros, effectively. That we block that by this, this peculiar trickery here with the definition. So uh, we block zero from being an ir irrep. So actually, we're not allowed, to, we'll never end up there. Uh, and th this, this edge case uh, turns out to be, it turns out to be true that V is a direct sum of irreducible representations. It's just a direct sum of zero uh, representations. 
And so we, we, never, we never land in the situation where we're, we're, we're direct summing on this an infinite number of times because we blocked it there with the definition. Uh, oh, oh, like, yeah, oh, I haven't actually, well, that, that's possible, that's actually allowed here as well. <laughs> so if there are no irreps at all of your group, it turns out that all groups have irreps, we'll see later. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, okay, there is, a, a left open, the, I think your question is, the possibility is that there could be a group that has no irreducible representations at all. I, I believe that that's also covered here. Okay. So it's, it's possible to, to have a vacuum space as, a direct, as an empty direct sum that has not any interviews? Yeah, it's yes. <laughs> it's weird, yeah. Um, it turns out it never happens, so, because every group will have representations. And I, we've actually given it, all right? So earlier on, how do we know we're not ever going to land in that situation? Well, I gave you three, three, three representations of every group. Remember the trivial representation? That's a representation. And so there's an, it's, it's non-empty. So this strange possibility where you could have no irreps at all is actually excluded by the fact that there is simple rep and there's the regular representation. You always get that one for free. So there's these other, the, the, you have these sort of like master representations. Each of them turn out to be direct sums of irreps. And that's how you know you've not landed in this pathological scenario where you have no irreps at all. So that's it. So we learn, because of those examples, actually, uh, that would have been a better answer to your question, actually. Uh, because we know that our, every group does have representations, I wrote them down last time, we know that every representation of every group can be broken down into a direct sum like this. So we've just learned something tremendous. We learned that no matter what representation you have, trivial, empty, whatever, whatever representation you have of your group, it's always a direct sum of some irreps wj. It's not unique. We have to say right now that this decomposition is not unique. And let's talk about non-uniqueness for a bit. There's a bit that is unique and there's a bit that's not unique. So if each representation had a different dimension, then there would be a unique decomposition. You know, one way to do it uniquely would be to just line up these representations in order of increasing dimension. The prob problem, if you like, is when two or more irreducible representations have the same dimension, then there's no real unique way to say which one comes first. We'll deal with that later, actually. It's called multiplicities. And there's a canonical way to get over that as well. Because you're a physicist and you've done quantum mechanics and you've done tensor products, we're going to be able to skip a, a chunk of, uh, of uh, representation theory because I can just say in one line stuff that you would otherwise have to tediously uh, justify. So it's very convenient. So what we're going to do and what's the bit that we're going to skip we're going to learn now how we're going to use these irreducible representations to build new representations. So we've now broken down everything into atoms. So there's a periodic table of irreducible representations for every group, no matter which group you choose, which finite, finite uh, size group you choose. 
There's like a periodic table of all its irreducible representations. There are books you can down, download by where they list tediously one after the other, each group and all of its irreducible representations. These books are out there, you can get them. They're very thick books uh, and it's been done. So the task of understanding representations for most groups that you care about can be solved with a Google these days because you don't even need the books. If you just say, I've got the dihedral group of order 24, tell me all the irreducible representations, you will land on the Wikipedia webpage with the list of all the irreducible representations. And that's like its periodic table of atoms. And then, uh, and we're gonna learn how, the, how to get those tables, that's part of, this, part of this course. But before we get onto the business of understanding how to build these irreps from, from nothing, so to speak, we wanna understand what we can build from the atoms. So suppose you've got the list of all the irreps of a group now, you, you've Googled it, here they are. It's always a finite list for a finite group. The question is, what can we build from this? You know, remember when I say irrep, there's actually corresponding to each irrep, there's a, a homomorphism, rho j, a specific homomorphism that goes from the group into G L W J. What can we build from that? Well, we can direct sum them, right? That we've done that already. If you've got two irreps, then you can take the direct sum and you automatically get another representation of the group, does everything right. But there's some other operations you know in linear algebra, in quantum mechanics, and in the quantum mechanics of many particles. Let's just try those three operations that should jump to your mind fairly quickly if you start thinking about systems of particles, systems of identical particles, and bosons and fermions. There are two or three things you can build with irreps that are very, very handy. And so here we go. Here's three, three, um, three things to build. So let's do it like we did in advanced quantum theory. If I want to have a, a theory of more than one particle, so you think of these as quantum mechanical systems, one particle quantum mechanical systems. So what can you do if you have, if you want to describe a system of two or more particles that are distinguishable? Well, right, tensor. Tensor is how I build a Hilbert space for two, two particles. Uh, is that a representation? The answer is yes. It may not be an irrep, it's, it's, it's going to be reducible, but it, it is definitely a representation. And what is the representation? Well, you just take the tensor product of those homomorphisms, right? of those unitaries. And you can check that that's also a You can check that that obeys the definition of a representation. So the minute you have one atom, one single particle quantum mechanical system with a Hilbert space WJ, then you can start talking about many particle quantum mechanical systems by just tensoring them up. And you might go, well, that's distinguishable. We, in quantum mechanics of many particles, we learned that there are bosons and fermions. Is it the case that those are representations as well? And the answer is absolutely. Let's talk about bosons. So suppose I want to build bosons out of these representations. How do I do it? Well, we know this, this thing called uh, the symmetric or the, the, the Fox base, right, of the N particles. Gamma plus will do. So you can build Fox space of N particles. I'll just put an N here. Uh, and that is a representation as well 
of the group. So for example, you know, that's P plus on WJ tensor WJ. And what's the action? Well, it's none other than gamma plus of rho of J. So just by knowing bosons, you, you've automatically built loads of new representation. Remember, the, remember what I was emphasizing in the first lecture? Rho is the dynamics of your quantum system. Um, that was bosons, and of course there's fermions. And the rep is the same. There you go. For free, I've just built three. Because you know about many particle quantum mechanics, once you have irreps, you instantly know loads more quantum mechanical systems you could, that would also be representations of the group. And the, the quantum mechanics of an indistinguishable number of uh, indeterminate number of particles also gives you a representation, right? Anytime you can build a quantum mechanical system from smaller quantum mechanical systems, you can do the same with representations. Now we're going to go into the a seemingly completely different topic. Our objective now, I, I hope I've given you a sense of how representation theory works, right? We start with the, the symmetries that we care about. They're labeled by elements of a group. And then we talk about what it means for those symmetries to act on a quantum mechanical system, namely by unitaries. And these unitaries have to play nicely together in the same way that the group does. And then we note that every, every set of unitaries that, that works has sub-representations and that there are some special representations called irreducible representations, which can't be built from others. So you can see this kind of reductionist argument is going to force us to, to start answering the question, well, what are these irreps then? How do I find them? How do I build them? And in order to do that, we're going to take a, a very st seemingly strange diversion. We're going to start talking about things called characters, which at the, at the outset look like they have nothing to do with this question. So for the next lecture or two, we're going to talk about things that aren't going to look like they're related to the, the goal of understanding irreps. But whole, you know, uh, be patient. We're going to get there. The physics of characters is interesting. Uh, will give you an interpretation of these things that I'm about to write down, and it will be helpful. Uh, but they're not something that you typically encounter in quantum mechanical systems as a physical observable. It's kind of a mathematical thing that you might do.
Okay, I'm going to start by defining something like that you very well know. All right, let's just remind you of some basic linear algebra that you had not forgotten, but hey. So we're going to start by just a vector space V, just your quantum mechanical system with dimension n, if you like. Uh, I, we don't need the scalar product for this part, but we could. Uh, so let's suppose we have some basis labeled by these, these vectors here. And let's suppose we have some linear transformation of our vector space, some matrix. Then what does the trace mean? It means you just sum the diagonal elements of A. And you know from your linear algebra background that for diagonal A, that's the same as the sum of the eigenvalues of A. Now this is basis independent. So we learned that the trace is basis independent. So there's something kind of magical about every basis independent thing you can construct. Because it says that, uh, you know, remember, a choice of basis is a human artifice. It's something that we, we introduce to make sense of something. And we better hope that at the end of the day, our quantities don't depend on the basis we chose. Otherwise, we made a mistake, right? You know, if, if it depends what color we color in our, our equations in, with which colored pencil we use to derive our proof, then there's something wrong with our proof. So this is why we love basis independent quantities like the trace. It doesn't depend on the base. And in representation theory, there's no exception. We don't want our statements to depend on the basis we chose. So we're going to try and build things from basis independent quantities. Those will have some interpretation. This one doesn't have a direct physical interpretation, although there is one that can be extracted. So once you have seen that the trace is, is a thing, then you might wonder, what can I build from this thing? And the answer is you can build the trace of a representation. Okay, what a seemingly innocuous thing to do. What have we done here? We've taken a representation that, remember, that's a homomorphism. It's a way of assigning a matrix to every element of the group. So we've got a bunch of matrices, one for each element of the group. And then we said, let's just take the trace of those matrices. So this doesn't depend on the basis, right? So this is now, you can think of this as a function of just elements of the group, right? Chi, what does it do? It takes an element of the group and gives you a number, right? It's a complex number. It goes from the group to the complex numbers, this, this thing that we just built. That is a called a character of the representation.
either the character of rho or the character of v, depending on what way you want to write it. Now, this is where the connection to quantum mechanics is kind of stretched a bit and hard to interpret. If you have a unitary matrix, sure, that's easy to interpret, right? That's an operation we do in quantum mechanics. Taking the trace of a state, that makes sense, right? Traces of states, that should be one. Taking the traces of states multiplied by observables, that makes sense, right? That's, that's, that's something you can do in quantum mechanics, represents expectation values. Taking the trace of a unitary is not something that you do in quantum mechanics. It's an unusual thing to do. It doesn't have a oper direct operational interpretation. So there's a bit of a stretched analogy going on here. You can build it, uh, and uh, it is helpful in quantum mechanics, but it doesn't, it's not going to be the result of an experiment. You can't directly measure the trace of a unitary. There is one experiment that you can do where you, you could build, which indirectly gives you the trace of a unitary, but it's not something you can directly observe from clicks and detectors. What you can measure, though, are partition functions. So there is a fairly deep connection between characters and partition functions in thermodynamics. That's something we won't be able to touch at all in this course, but just you know, be aware that characters have some connection to physics, but in a slightly roundabout way. Now that we've built this thing called the character, we're going to try and learn stuff about it, and we're going to leverage this character to be able to do some tremendous things. In the end, we're going to be able to classify uh, all irreducible representations using just these functions here. So they, they turn out to be extraordinarily powerful things. But first, some properties. So let's suppose now we have a representation row, someone gave it to us, and it has degree n or dimension n. Then there's a couple of really simple things you can prove. Uh, this is, I'm not going to prove them, this is really exercise stuff for you. Um, the character of the identity of the, un of the uh, uh, unit element of the group that has a number n. Like, do I really need to prove this? I don't, right? Because the trace of the identity matrix is n. What happens if you take the inverse? You can just take the complex conjugate of the character. What happens if you have a conjugation? Well, they cancel out. That just comes from the cyclic rule of trace.
So I'm not going to prove these three things. But I'm going to go ahead and bet that you'll encounter these things called class functions at some point in some other subject that you study. So if you have a function from a group to some complex numbers, and a character is an example of a function from a group to some complex numbers, and that function obeys just property three, it has a name. It's called the cl a class function. Um, they're interesting because they're invariant under basis changes. Okay, further properties of these characters, we just have to kind of collect their properties. Let's suppose we have two representations now. So now we're going to so, suppose we have two representations. We can build a character for each representation. We just take the trace of their corresponding matrices. Um, so if you take the direct sum of the two representations, what's the character going to be? Well, right, you know. It's just the sum of the characters. No? You just take a block matrix and take its trace, then you just get the sum of the traces. And correspondingly, of the tensor product. You can also work out the character of the boson representation and the fermion representation. I won't do that here. Um, that's an that's a exercise, if you like. Okay, I'm going to end today with stating the big result of representation theory, another really big one. prove this result in the next lecture. So we're going to call this proposition Shaw's lemma, because why not?
Right. This is this result tells us or gives us conditions, if you like, on irreps and tells us what irreps can't do. We will see uh, multiple other interpretations of, the res of this result in the following lectures. What we're going to assume that going into this this lemma proposition um, is the assumption that we have two irreps. Somehow we've managed to find two irreducible representations of our group. They're called row one and row two. And we're going to be exploring the idea that one irrep can be somehow built from the other irrep, right? Not by direct sums, of course not. That's not how it works. But perhaps by um, some kind of map. Perhaps, perhaps we can build all irreps from just one irrep just by like applying some auxiliary linear map to one of them and you can build all the rest from it. Well, let's try it out. So suppose you had a linear map, a kind of mm, you know, uh, universal map that if you do it first and then uh, this, this irrep row S2, that's the same as doing the row, irrep row S1 and then just doing this map, right? So you can build all your other irreps from the original one just with this universal linear map. Suppose this thing existed, like it could exist. Well, then two things are, are true. Uh, and this gives us a really interesting necessary conditions on, on irreps. So if these two irreducible representations are not isomorphic, that means there's no basis change between them, then sorry, you're out of luck. That, that map doesn't exist, it's actually the zero map. So when two irreducible representations aren't related by a basis change, there's no universal uh, operation which can build you one irrep from the other. It just doesn't exist. Um, well, what happens if they are the same? Even then, n not any uh, operation has this property. In fact, the only things that uh, commute with all unitaries coming from a representation, turns out to be the identity or matrices proportional to the identity. So it might not be obvious at this stage how powerful this result is, but we're going to see this is what allows us to build effectively irreducible representations from uh, the regular representation. We're going to use this result multiple times, and we're going to build projections with this result. But that's really a topic for the next lectures. And uh, also, this is just an invitation to keep being interested in what's coming up next. But for now, that's it. Uh, thank you very much.